A popular topic to discuss throughout the Pokemon community would be the timeline. In what order do our favourite games go? Now if you've watched my videos before then you'll know that I'm not really one for posting theories, so this is a little bit of a change in pace. But the Pokemon timeline is something that I've always found extremely interesting, so I'm happy to finally be putting my take on it out there. I figured I'd wait until the newest games came out so that it would be as accurate as possible. Having said that, there are a couple of things that I need to put out there before we begin the video. A lot of what I say is speculative, so don't take it too seriously if you disagree with me. And secondly, I'm only going to be including main series games in this video, being all main series games from Red and Blue to Sun and Moon. I enjoy a lot of the Pokemon spin-off titles, but some of them are either set in a completely different universe, like the Mystery Dungeon series, or would honestly make the video a lot more complicated than it would have to be. But anyway, where exactly do we start? Well, figuring out the Pokemon timeline is actually a lot easier now thanks to one tweet made in 2014. Toshinobu Matsumiya, who's been an employee of Game Freak since Generation 1, confirmed the timeline on Twitter. Generation 1 and 3 take place at the same time, so it's safe to say that their remakes take place around the same time too. Next comes Generation 2, which in-game has been stated to take place three years after Generation 1. Generation 2's plot focuses on the aftermath of Giovanni's disappearance on Team Rocket. In the Johto games, you actually get to travel back to Kanto and see how much it's changed. Cinnabar Island was destroyed by an eruption, and a few of the gyms have new leaders. Taking place at the same time as Generation 2 is Generation 4, so that's the first four generations taking place within around three years or so. Next is Generation 5, starting with Black and White. It's not actually known how many years later this occurs, but I would estimate it to be anywhere between 6 and 8. There are a few things that we can use to figure this out. First is the character Caitlyn. She's actually Caitlyn from Generation 4's Battle Frontier. It is known that at the time of these games she was 14 years of age, but in Generation 5 she has clearly aged since then. The the second factor is this Team Rocket grunt. Now, you probably recognise his odd speech pattern, right? Well, this is actually the Team Rocket grunt from Gold and Silver. During the time between Generation 2 and 4 and these games, he got married and had a young son. The son's overworld sprite is that of a school kid, and I would estimate their age judging by the school kid trainer sprite to be somewhere between 6 and 8. Confirmed to take place two years after Black and White are Black and White 2 and X and Y. Black and White 2 pick up two years after the main events of Black and White, but it's clear that a lot has changed. The characters that you know and love from the first games have grown up and followed their dreams. A lot around Universe changed too. The Marine Tube was built, Route 10 was destroyed by a landslide, and the gyms of Univer are all different in some way. And, the tweet that we mentioned earlier confirms that X and Y take place at the same time as Black and White 2. But X and Y, or well, mainly Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, is where it starts to get a little bit weird. This is due to the introduction of Mega Evolution. With X and Y, it doesn't really contradict the other entries in the series, simply because it's new. It's kind of just like adding new evolutions to Pokemon. Obviously, the real reason why these evolutions don't exist in the earlier generations is because they haven't been designed yet, but when you try and justify it within the Pokemon universe, you can say that the reason that you couldn't breed two Marils to get an Azuril is because there's no way to get a Sea Incense in Gold and Silver, not because Azuril didn't exist in the Pokemon universe. And throughout the generations, they've done a pretty good job of not contradicting what we've come to know in previous games. Say for example, in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, the Razor Claw and Fang are available in the post-game Battle Frontier, an area that isn't even available in Generation 2. Though, having said that, in Fire Red and Leaf Green, Pokemon with high friendship just straight up start evolving and then stop if you don't have the National Dex. Not the best way of handling it, but I guess there wasn't really much else that could have been done. It may seem a little confusing, but this was how I justified Mega Evolutions existing in Pokemon X and Y and not the other games. They weren't featured in those other games, but that doesn't mean that they weren't a part of the Pokemon universe. Just like actual evolutions added to Pokemon in later generations. But Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire is where things get a little confusing. Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire are not the first time Pokemon games have been remade. Of course, there's Fire and Leaf Green and Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Aside from the expanded Pokedex and the odd new facility here and there, these are faithful remakes of the original games. Any extra features don't change the course of the main story from what it was in the original games they're based on. The one exception to this rule is the introduction of the Sevi Isles toward the end of the main story in Fire and leaf green, but this doesn't impact the other events in the main story. But Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire really can't be classed as the same as Ruby and Sapphire, because the events of the main story are too different. Some areas in the game, like Marble City, look completely unrecognisable from what they were in Ruby and Sapphire. 
but the most telling part is that Mega Evolution is heavily featured within the main story. And during the climax of the main story, Groudon and Kyogre take on different forms after they awaken, which was most definitely not a feature in Ruby and Sapphire. In Auras, Deoxys never crashed into Earth and created Birth Island and is still out in space. Rayquaza is now caught as part of an entirely different post-game storyline, being the Delta episode, where it too takes on a different form as part of the story, which of course heavily contradicts the events of Ruby and Sapphire. The way we start to make sense of this is through the new character Zinnia. During the Delta episode, we get this quote. That's right, a Hoenn region exactly like the one we live in. A world where maybe the evolution of Pokemon took a slightly different path, where Mega Evolution is unknown. What Zinnia is referring to is the possibility of there being alternate timelines within the Pokemon universe. Due to this, it's commonly thought that X, Y, Omega Ruby, and Alpha Sapphire lie on what is called the Mega Timeline, while the rest of the games that we know of lie on the non-Mega Timeline. Though, to be honest, you could argue that split timelines have actually been a thing since the very beginning. All initial games of a generation are released in pairs, and the events of the game, even if only very slightly, play out differently in each version. And then the third versions have more different again, meaning that they would have to take place on an alternate timeline too. As for the first two remakes, being Fire and Leaf Green and Heart Gold and Soul Silver do have very slight changes, even if they don't impact the main story much. This is where we go back to the Sevi Islands, a new place in Fire and Leaf Green. Though the events are mostly post-game, you are able to access Islands 1 through 3 during the main story, which sets it apart from Generation 1, meaning that these two remakes would probably occur on different timelines as well if you wanted to be that picky. But to keep our timelines as neat as possible, we'll just leave it as the Mega and non-Mega timelines. So now, this leaves us with the newest games, Pokémon Sun and Moon. So, where exactly do they fit in? Well, for a start, they're somewhere on the Mega Timeline, as Mega Evolution is a feature in Sun and Moon. I thought it was easy to place these games before they even came out. If you recall, there's a backpacker from Alola who circles the Hotels of Kalos. It's the same person that gives you the strange souvenir. He talks about his region's champion being something else. By this logic, you'd think that Sun and Moon would take place at around the same time as X and Y. But now that Sun and Moon are out, we now know that the Pokémon League isn't even complete until the very end of the main story. So in light of this, you'd think that they actually take place a little while before X and Y, right? Wrong. A small detail that I noticed when I was playing the games contradicts this and places Sun and Moon a few years ahead of X and Y. After you battle Sino or Dexio in Hihi City, Dexio will state, This battle reminded me of us in the past, and that group of five young trainers. Which would of course be referring to the player character in X and Y, the player's rival, Shauna, Tiano, and Trevor. Though there is one small detail that actually confirms the gap to be two years. Notes for the official artwork of Grimsley, a member of the Univer Elite Four, states that it's Grimsley two years later. And considering Black and White 2 was the last time that Grimsley was seen, and that Black and White 2 take place at the same time as X and Y, we can confirm the gap between these games and Sun and Moon to be two years. I do have to credit Almighty Arceus for pointing this out to me though. We had a long conversation about the timeline and he pointed out this detail which I had no idea about, but it really does make a lot of difference. He makes Pokemon videos too, so if you want to check out his channel then there will be a link down below. Two characters that really do show the passage of time would be Red and Blue. At this point, I've estimated there to be a minimum time span of 13 years throughout the whole timeline so far, which would put these two at age 24. And comparing their current artwork to their initial artwork at age 11, I have to say it sounds reasonable. So does that wrap it up for the Pokemon timeline so far? No. There are still a few things we need to go over. While Red and Blue sure do look different, there is still one thing that I need to talk about. While what I've talked about in relation to Sun and Moon does seem to add up so far, there is one thing that was bugging me. The appearance of Wally in the Battle Tree. What's wrong with this? Well, Auras should take place at the same time as the games that they're based on, shouldn't they? Irrespective of alternate timelines, they should still take place at the same point. Seeing as we've estimated a minimum of 13 years passing since the events of Kanto and Hoenn, why does Wally still look like he's 10 years old? Well, well, there's only one way that I can justify it. But to do that, we have to go back to Black and White 2. So, in Black and White 2, there's this new facility called the Pokemon World Tournament. Here, you're able to battle gym leaders from all past generations, and it's pretty awesome. But something that always bugged me was that even though it's proven that a significant amount of time has passed between Generation 4 and Black and White, why do all of the gym leaders look the same? It makes no sense. For example, take Bugsy. Definitely one of the younger looking gym leaders hasn't changed a bit. 
All of the gym leaders from Generation 1, 2, and 4 use the same basic sprites that they did in the previous games, the only difference being a few new extra frames of animation thrown in for good measure. Other than that, they're all the same. The only characters that have even slightly different sprite designs to their original games will be the Generation 3 gym leaders, and the only reason for this is because the sprites from Generation 3 were just way too outdated to work with, so they had to make new ones. Other than that, their designs are exactly the same as they were in Generation 3. None of them have changed or aged even slightly. Even Red and Blue still look the same. With a likely minimum of six years passing since Generation 4, it really does make such little sense that they would look identical to their previous appearances. The only way I can justify this is simply that characters are only redesigned if it's important enough. It's like, why even bother completely redesigning and making entirely new trainer sprites for three sets of gym leaders when you have ones that still look good from the previous generation? Generation 4 was still on the DS, so its sprite designs fit right in. It was probably hassle enough having to make entirely new sprites for all the Generation 3 characters, which is likely why their designs look as similar as they possibly could to their original appearances. It's not just trainers that were treated this way either. While Generation 5 does have moving sprites, the basic sprite designs for almost all Pokemon below Generation 5 come right from Generation 4, mainly Diamond and Pearl. And then we saw this happen again in Sun and Moon. All Pokemon models that weren't from Generation 7 were ripped directly from X and Y. And Generation 7 does draw similar parallels to Generation 6, like Generation 4 and 5 did. There's a limit to just how different the aesthetics of two generations can be when they're developed for the same system. Chances are a decent amount of it is going to look very similar. As I've already said, if it already looks similar enough to the previous generation due to system capabilities, then why bother redesigning Pokemon and trainers when you have designs and aesthetics from the previous generation that work just as well? Though the direct reuse of aesthetics mainly applies to Red, Blue, and the rest of the trainers found in the Pokemon World Tournament. As for Wally, he did receive a new model and animation, though this was probably only because the new ones had to be made to adapt to the new presentation of Battles in Sun and Moon. The basic design for Wally is identical to that featured in Oras. I can only say that this is because Wally just wasn't significant enough of a character to redesign. They just needed someone to represent Hoenn. Grimsley and Chorus were redesigned, but this was likely only because they actually do feature in the main story. For characters like Wally and Cynthia, there just wasn't enough of a reason for them to be completely redesigned when they never even feature outside of the battle tree anyway. Wally should look a lot different, just like Red and Blue should have looked a lot different in the Pokemon World Tournament of Black and White 2, but the reason that they don't is because it would have been way too much of a hassle to redesign them. The only reason Red and Blue were redesigned this time was because they were seen outside of the battle tree, and because they were also used to promote this feature before the games were even released. I don't know about you, but seeing older versions of Red and Blue in these new games certainly is an eye-catcher, so whatever was planned worked. But is that finally it for the timeline? Not quite. There is one more feature of Sun and Moon that I believe supports the theory of alternate timelines, so I have to talk about it. If you don't want spoilers for the aftergame, then I guess don't watch this part, but I think it's pretty important. So in the aftergame, you join Annabelle and Lucca to track down the Ultra Beasts. Wait. Annabelle? Yup, your eyes don't deceive you. This is Annabelle from the Battle Frontier. It's later revealed that Annabelle is a faller, a person who has come through an ultra wormhole. Apparently Annabelle was found unconscious on a beach, only remembering her name, and that she protected some tower in Hoenn, which you will probably recognize as the Battle Tower from Pokemon Emerald. Now, remember that the Battle Frontier isn't even in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, so this has to be talking about Emerald. While it is stated in-game that the Battle Frontier is planned to be built in the future, it's not known if this actually happened, and we never even saw that timeline's Annabelle. Even so, I can prove that the Annabelle that we see in Sun and Moon is originally from Emerald's timeline, not Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire's. It's simple, you're able to come up against Annabelle in the battle tree later in the game, and when you do, listen to the music that plays. None other than the Frontier Brain theme from Pokemon Emerald. Why else would they have used this? There was even an updated version of this theme featured in Oras 2.
love Emerald's soundtrack, but it's undeniably very outdated by 3DS standards. So bearing that in mind, why would they choose to use this theme over the newer one? Because it's this Annabelle's theme. At some point after the events of Pokemon Emerald, she must have somehow entered an Ultra Wormhole, and then came out on the other end into the Mega Timeline in Alola, and lost her memories. Now, I'm very aware that this draws a lot of parallels with what happened with Lucker in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. You find Lucker unconscious on a beach and he can't remember anything. But seeing as Lucker has featured in every generation since his debut, I think we will find the answer someday. The likelihood is that at some point, the Lucker of a different timeline entered an Ultra Wormhole and came out into the Mega Timeline of Auras and lost his memories. That just about wraps it up for the Pokemon timeline. Do bear in mind that a lot of what I've said is purely speculative, so I may be proven wrong in the future. If you have your own theory on the Pokemon timeline, then share it down in the comments below. I'd like to see it. This video really was a lot of fun to research and make, so I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. But as always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!